I was there in 2007 when, when they tried to amend the Venezuelan Constitution. Um, there were a lot of articles up for grabs. It was essentially the size of War and Peace, uh, and um, it was a lot. Um, it was on the ballot, people were voting, absolutely hard fought back and forth about whether to adopt all 56 or not. They had to be adopted as a group. You couldn't vote for just 12 of them and not vote for the other 44. So it was an intense discussion. And so uh, we had been out at polling places all day. And at 1 AM, uh, there was an announcement that uh, President Chavez was coming on TV. And he came on TV, and this is what he said. Well, friends, he said, the opposition has defeated our amendments to the Constitution by one quarter of one percent. And so we congratulate them and we say the struggle continues. Let me just say, I'm not the worst person in the world, but if I were one quarter of one percent away from something really important, and I'll just say this right in front of you, I, I, I might finesse. <laughs> I might finesse one quarter of one percent. A lot's riding on it. He got on the live TV at 1 a.m. and said, they're one quarter of one percent. They beat us. Congratulations. The struggle continues. So when we look at the fact that the Carter Center said in 2012 that the single best electoral system in the world, mm -hmm. given all the places they have observed elections, including our own country, Mm -hmm. All the places they had observed, they, Venezuela had the single best electoral system. And I will never forget that moment of him coming on at 1 a.m., looking a little tired, but conceding that, hey, it was a hair's thin margin, but congratulations. The other thing that's very important at this point is to look at, at the situation in terms of the sanctions and um, all the recent uh, economic activity. And Dan will go into that in, in more detail. But it's absolutely the case. But as we look at the year since 1998, uh, this uh, presentation subtitled, uh, you know, a, a coup in the making for 21 years. If you look at the actions that the United States has been involved in over the course of those years, uh, many of which I think even wise people in this country were not aware of, every single one of them. And so we're all playing catch up in some ways about what's been going on there since 1998. But lockouts uh, at PDVSA, the National Oil Company, uh, the coup itself, um, endless opportunities to fund opposition groups. There was more funding in the opposition under Obama than under Bush. Um, all in the name of, of citizenship development and, uh, and voter empowerment. And, and so it was USAID and it was the National Endowment for Democracy. And it's, it's just all interesting that the only people being empowered were one political strike. Um, but it was always in the guise of uh, this, is, this is to empower people to be better citizens. And so that went on and the coup and the interventions each time with elections, and, and Dan can go into it in greater detail, but when you boycott an election then lose 100% um, to zero, and then say, see, I told you it was great. Mm -hmm. Aren't we all out of junior high in this room? And if you don't <laughs> run, and then say, see, they got 100% votes, like Albania. Well, that's because you and your uh, allies uh, overseas chose to do that. So you could then say it was fixed. But in point of fact, in the 2018 election, uh, of course, Maduro got the same percentage of the eligible vote as Obama did in 2008. Got more than Obama got in 2012, and got more than Donald Trump got in 2016. And so we need to keep in mind, as we move through these days, that this process has been going on for years, it's been multifaceted, um, and it has been relentless. The fact that the Venezuelan people are still standing, that there is still a legacy to defend, as Jorge was saying, is a miracle um, because of the onslaught that they have faced. And it's not only what was happening inside their country, obviously. In the course of these years, <coughs> The continent 
has changed <coughs> 15 years ago uh, to virtually all progressive governments to now virtually all right-wing governments. There's been no significant change this rapid since 1980 when the Santa Fe document was put out as the main policy guidance for the Reagan administration and they said that in 13 revolutions in the last five years and we're going to turn all of them around. <coughs> and in the course of eight years they accomplished most of those goals. There's been no comparable rapid change of politics in a hemispheric sense <coughs> since those days. And so now instead of Venezuela being part of, a, of an enormous number of countries that are uh, working in the same direction, finds itself uh, with fewer and fewer friends. And so that's why it's uh, obviously very important for us uh, to be aware of that and to, to be allies uh, in, that, in that process. The last thing I want to say, and then I will uh, let Dan take over, is that <clears throat> it's been important, I think, over the course of the last couple of months to see who's been um, brought back into decision making and, and policy making in this. Um, one thing that was part of the bio, I don't know if you saw it, but I was the executive director of Witness for Peace in the old days. Um, we took 4,000 people into active war zones in Nicaragua. We took them over roads that were mined. We were in villages that were attacked. Um, and we thought that U.S. citizens should be seeing firsthand what was happening to people uh, using our tax dollars, and that was the first time in American history um, that a group in the U.S. took U.S. citizens into active war zones, and I was part of that effort from 1983 to 1993. Um, other people then took that and ran with it and did amazing things more courageous than we could ever have been, like Kathy Kelly and other people. Um, but that's where that began. And Elliot Abrams, uh, look. <coughs> Elliot Abrams, I held in my lap kids with no legs because of Elliot Abrams and Oliver North. Yes. Not because there's no God or no justice in the world, not because something happened and dropped out of the sky, because of Oliver North and Elliot Abrams. John Negroponte, we can't forget it. No. They always talk about a troika these days. Yeah. Oh, there's, the, there's our troika. Yeah. Tens of thousands of civilians in Nicaragua, and we saw them and knew them. So that's who has been brought back at this key moment in this process. This is a slow motion coup, 21 years in coming. Yeah. But they see this, I think, as the weakest moment, the most dangerous moment, the most difficult moment for the Venezuelans, and so the one to take advantage of it. And that's, that's where we are tonight as we gather here. Um, I'm a Vietnam era draft resistor. I'm, I'm old, around a long time. I've been doing this stuff for 54 years in one way or another. I've never seen anything, and I mean this, as cynical yes. as applying sanctions that have created billions and billions and billions of dollars of suffering in yes. Venezuela intentionally, yes. and then take $20 million worth of stuff to a border with Richard Branson yes. and some has-been uh, Latino uh, musical guys. When you have created billions and billions and billions of dollars in suffering as an intentional policy, and then cynically talk to our neighbors who aren't here tonight, and they say, well, if people are hungry, if they don't have any medicine, why doesn't that bastard let that stuff across the border? They're just being human, our neighbors, by saying, well, if they're in trouble, why are they doing that? And we have to find a way to say to people, it's cynical, it's cruel, and it cannot be uh, um, tolerated on our part. It's billions and billions of dollars, and that's what the sanctions are about. That's what all the recent stuff is about. So that, in fact, things get worse and the news is tightened. That's where we are. It's a long time in coming. Um, We'll have some time to talk about it later tonight. But here's the thing. The other thing about remembering stuff, 
my memory's still pretty good. And so I'm remembering that the countries that I have seen firsthand be affected negatively and cruelly in the course of my life. Look at them. Look at Haiti, where jean Bertrand Aristide was spirited away in the night and woke up and found himself in the Central Africa Republic. And he's a hero in Venezuela because when Hugo Chavez was taken away just for 47 hours and it was only an island off the coast, they had some sympathy with that. Look at the long suffering people of Haiti at the hands of US policy. And it starts long ago, long ago. William Jennings Bryan, when he was Secretary of State, you know, uh, an advisor came in and said, there's trouble going on in Haiti, Secretary Bryan. And he said, hmm, and he's listening thoughtfully and so forth. And then they said, what should we do? And he looked at the guy and said, can you believe it? Nigger speaking French. That was, that was his response. Can you believe it? Nigger speaking French. So, policy of ours over these years has been characterized by, by cruelty, and uh, it's also been characterized by not telling the truth about people. You look at Guatemala and the Bay of Pigs, where David Atlee Phillips, head of the Western Hemisphere Division of the CIA, was in charge of both those operations, and at critical moments he would say to his, his advisors, it's time to crank up the war lizard. In other words, drown out what last few words of truth there are with a propaganda effort and a media effort that is absolutely stifling. Time to crank up the war lizard. Look at Chile with Nixon and Kissinger proudly saying, we have to make the economy serene. Who was going to be screaming if not children and women and men who were simply trying to live their lives? Look at Nicaragua, a country I knew really, really well. And look at George Bush Sr. saying, we'll keep up this pressure until they cry, uncle. And they did, because they were devastated and finally had no heart left. Look at Venezuela. With President Obama in 2015 saying that Venezuela constituted a unique and extraordinary threat to US national security. And now I only add one from a different hemisphere because last week uh, Marco Rubio in his Twitter account, she was showing pictures of, of Gaddafi. Look at Secretary of State Hillary Clinton when Gaddafi was overthrown. And she, you know, too cute by half, said, we saw, we came, we, and he died. And she proudly tweeted uh, that and amended to Julius Caesar. We came, we saw, he died. There was a kind of cruelty, a kind of cynical approach. And part of why I'm here tonight, and part of why I think all of you are here tonight, is to say, that's not the best we can do. It's not what we want to do. It's not the face that we want to show to one another, or our neighbors, and certainly not the face we want to show to the rest of the world. And so, um, Thank you all for being here. teaches at the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. He served 25 years as Associate General Counsel of the United Steelworkers. Then is a long-time advisor 
activist, I'm sorry, opposed U.S. intervention in Latin America, was an observer of all Maduro's elections, and uh, welcome him, please. <laughs> so much for coming out uh, tonight. Actually hearing some of the speakers before me, I had a flood of memories of my own and, and, and different thoughts came across. So before I get to my prepared remarks, just a few things uh, occurred to me. First of all, while well, this speech is not about Venezuela, I do have a few things to say about Nicaragua. I was there in July and I just got back from Nicaragua in January. And uh, Nicaragua is part of the so-called Troika of Tyranny that John Bolton says he wants to overthrow. So, I mean, they're, they're, you know, when we speak of Venezuela, we have to speak about Nicaragua and, and Cuba. Just a few things to bring you up to date, because I don't think you probably heard this on NPR or read it in the New York Times. There were regional elections on Monday in Nicaragua and the Atlantic Coast. The famous Atlantic Coast, where there have been issues with the Mosquito Indians and whatnot. There are now three autonomous regions in the Atlantic coast thanks to the Nicaraguan revolutionary constitution. They had regional elections on Monday and the Sandinistas won huge in those elections. Did you hear about that? Did you hear about MRR, MNR consulting uh, their poll in December of last year, the end of the year? Very well respected polling company. Uh, polled Nicaraguans and found that, that uh, Daniel Ortega has a 55% approval rating. Meanwhile, last year, Nicaragua was ranked fifth in the world for gender equality. The top four were Iceland, Sweden, Denmark, and Ice, did I say Iceland? It was four Scandinavian countries, in any case. And out of nowhere is Nicaragua. And yet this is not something you will hear about uh, in the news. Nicaragua was the first place that I was conscientiousized. I was 19 years old. I went there to do reforestation work in Ocotal on the border. And like so many people, probably many people here, it changed my life. Uh, within a few months, actually, I would spend a night in Cook County Jail with Kathy Kelly, having protested uh, the war in Central America. Is it really uh, a movement uh, so much? Um, and I was raised Catholic, and I think I think uh, that that has been a big part of of my love for Latin America, as it is for for um, many people. And the one thing that occurs to me when some of the remarks are made about Venezuela, frankly, is how forgiving this revolution has been, how Christian, if you don't mind me saying, it's been. And, and, and Chavez was a devoted Christian. I believe he was Roman Catholic, if I'm not mistaken. Um, one thing that occurs is uh, Mike mentioned the uh, Operacion uh, Milagro, the, the, uh, which was the mission that Venezuela and Cuba worked on to restore people's sight. And they restored tens of thousands of people's sight throughout the hemisphere. And one individual that they returned the sight to was a Bolivian who they knew had murdered Ernesto Che Guevara and yet they provided free medical care to restore his eyesight. And this is really what the revolution is about. And, I, and you know, if anything, to me, the Bolivarian revolution has suffered from probably an overabundance of, of forgiveness. Um, after the coup in 2002 that was mentioned, where again Chavez was kidnapped, he was brought to an island, uh, for almost a total of two days. Some believe he was tortured there. He, he got off the helicopter when he returned. He was limping. It's uncertain how he was treated. But in any case, can you imagine if you or I kidnapped Donald Trump? I hate to even say it publicly, right? Just to say it, I'm afraid 
you know, uh, the stormtroopers would come <laughs> through the roof, right? Can you imagine if we kidnapped Donald Trump and took him to an island for two days and he was restored as president? We would be vaporized, right? I would not be sitting here today. And yet that isn't what happened. Chavez became more conciliatory. He stopped, you may recall, wearing his fatigues in his red beret. He started wearing civilian clothing. He actually reached out to the opposition. He decided that the coup, while wrong, was at least some sign that, he, you know, he needed to, uh, to be less strident in, in, in how he was leading. And there were very few people who suffered any penalty uh, from that event. Meanwhile, those involved in that coup showed their hand immediately about what they were about. On the first full day of the coup, uh, the opposition threw out the Constitution that had been democratically approved in 1999, disbanded the National Assembly, disbanded the Supreme Court, and fired every mayor and governor who'd been elected since Chavez was elected. This is democracy opposition style in Venezuela, and it's democracy's U.S. style, because as was mentioned, the U.S. was behind the coup, and the U.S. was one of the few countries that immediately recognized the coup government until, until it failed, and the U.S. had to sheepishly uh, walk that back. One historic event, and one of the things uh, that I like to talk about, because there is so much confusion even amongst the left about things like Venezuela and Nicaragua. And, and of course, the confusion is not accidental, it's intentional. You're meant to be confused. And so I like to talk about, like Chomsky does, and of course, I tend to like to channel Chomsky because he's the man, uh, uh, likes to talk about is this double standard that is used in the news to so confuse. So the one thing that occurred to me a few years ago, and I wrote about this, and actually Chomsky said, oh, I never thought of that. Um, <laughs> was two events, two separate events that happened in 1989. One, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, which two years ago, there was a huge 25th year commemoration, the news was all over, it talked about it, right? And, and while it was happening, you got live coverage every day of what was happening in Tiananmen Square. Huge historic event. Right, etched in our memories. In the Tiananmen Square massacre, it's not certain how many people were killed. By the way, none were killed in the square. If you want to trip somebody up, say how many people died in Tiananmen Square, nobody. But they were killed uh, in the periphery. It's estimated that 300 to 3,000 uh, protesters were killed during the Tiananmen Square massacre. It's hard to know because those things, you know, the dead aren't properly counted in situations like that. And that event uh, continues uh, to be legendary in, in the minds of people, particularly in the West. Meanwhile, in our continent, not so far away, in 1989, was the Caracaso in Venezuela. They just celebrated the anniversary of that on February 27th. Did you 